what is going on? It's another car buyer's guide. I'm going to keep them going. It's been, what, 60-something episodes? I've been doing this every day. Who else is putting out this much content? I don't know. Anyway, so today we're going to be doing the Jaguar F-Type. Specifically, I guess we're going to really focus on the V8s, but we're going to include all the engines because I just want to make a point to prove, or I have a point to prove to y'all that this, uh, the Jaguar F-Type just has the craziest lineup of options and trim levels and the most complicated system I've ever seen. Um, and I, I've been doing so many cars, as I mentioned, this is the 60 something, 63rd, 62nd, I don't know which one, but yeah, this, uh, there's so many different trim options for this car. It's like they changed what each trim meant every year or two. And so what we're going to be looking at today is the pre facelift one. So this one with this front end, you know, the facelift one has a more sleeker front end, but this, we're, uh, it's spanned in the United States from 20. Uh, 2014. Hey, shout out to Jacob Black in the chat. Shout out to you, man. Yeah, we're gonna do the the Jaguar F Type today. This is my favorite. Um, like you, I would call this like a European muscle car, but we'll we'll get into that. Um, so yeah, we're going over the 2014 to 2020 models. It's weird because in 2019, that's when Jaguar released their um facelift, but it didn't come out till 2021. I don't know if that has to do with the pandemic or I don't know what, but. 2019 is said when they did their facelift. However, you'll see 2020s still have the old body style. Um, but yeah, before we get into that, just some quick announcements. If you haven't joined my Discord, join it. It is an easy way for you to win 50 bucks. Everyone in here has the opportunity to win $50. I'm going to be doing a drawing on Monday. So you have really a couple more days to join it or else, you know, it's on you. You missed out on 50 bucks. But yeah, all you have to do is join the Discord. You have to like, comment, and subscribe on the channel as well as sharing a video or reel with someone, uh, family, friend, family, friend, uh, anybody, random person, doesn't really matter. But yeah, just make sure to join the Discord because that's where I pick the people from to win. And yeah, I promise I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this Discord lit. It's just uh, I've been so busy lately. Like, I don't even know where to start with this, honestly. Anyway, so uh, what else? I think that's it. If you haven't already liked the video, let's get to 20 likes today. I don't think I've ever gotten to 20 likes, so let's get that on this one. Back to the Jaguar F-Type. So we're going to go over first. Okay, let me explain what we do if you're new here. First, I'm going to go over the features, options, and problems with the car. And then I'm going to, we're going to take a look at some media, like some brochures, maybe some sound clips. And then after that, we're going to look at the ads so we can use that information that we learned from the features, options, and problems to accurately price what's out there on the market. So let's get into it. So here we go, the features, options, and problems, and then let me bring up the sheet, my notes. So you're going to see, if you're used to this show, you're going to notice that there is about like twice or three times as much notes for this as uh, previous cars I've done, simply because this car, the model lineup is so complicated, and it really doesn't need to be. It's just like they change the naming systems like every couple years, and I'm going to explain to you exactly what I mean right now. So as I mentioned, 2014 to 2020 are the years we're looking at. And there are a bunch of, there were three different engines. They had the, the four cylinder, the six cylinder, and the eight cylinder. The four cylinder only had one power output that was 296 and uh, horsepower and 295 pound feet of torque. And this is only for 2014 to 2020. That's what I'm talking This is the power numbers for those years. Obviously, later than 2020, the power numbers are going to be different. So for the V6, you had two options. We're going to call the high horsepower one the V6S engine um, for now. So the three liter V6 either came in 335 horsepower and 332 pound-feet of torque or 375 horsepower and 339 pound-feet of torque. So you could get the higher horsepower output version or the lower horsepower output version of the 3-liter V6. And then for the 5-liter V8, it came, well, first of all, in the earlier model years, you'll see right here. So basically, um, 14 and 15, there was a thing called a V8S, which is weird because now we think of the S to be associated with the V6, but in the, like in the original version of the car, the 14, 15 models, they actually had a V8S. And so that V8S had the five liter supercharged V8. Oh, by the way, all these, uh, the V6 and the V8 are both supercharged. The i4 is obviously turbocharged. But for the, um, for the V8S, it made slightly less power than the V8R and the V8S VR, which is the two other output versions. I'm going to call them. They don't really call them that, but that's, the uh, trim levels that those engines apply to. So the V8S made 488 horsepower, 461 pound-feet of torque. The 5-liter supercharged V8R, oh, again, these are all supercharged, but I just want to make sure that you guys understand that. It's uh, 542 horsepower and 502 pound-feet of torque. And then for the SVR, it makes 567 horsepower and 516 pound-feet of torque. 
this which makes this car very very powerful for its size it's a tiny car it's like it's literally a small tiny sports car it's only a two-seater and it has this much power with the svr it's an insane package a lot of people compare this car to like a 911 um yeah i mean you could in terms of its size it's not that big um it puts down a lot of power i wouldn't say it has the same characteristics as a 911 and 911 obviously handles a lot differently because of the engine placement um as well as uh, this car is a little bit heavier but uh, another th car this could be compared to is the Aston Martin Vantage and the reason why I say that is because the side profile on one of these looks almost exactly like a Vantage like you, you can't tell me that this isn't this isn't the new Aston Martin Vantage line let me see they just released a new one but Okay, yeah, but you see the lines here, very, wow, that was actually very close. You see how similar these are, Aston Martin and Jaguar? Even the tail lights look similar, but yeah. You can compare this, you know, Aston Martin Vantage, 911, I guess, in terms of where it would sit in terms of price. However, the difference between this and a 911 is that these are highly depreciated when compared to Porsches, which is really good for us as buyers. Um, I'd say that this car is one of the best values out there and it's not just because of the power it's also because of the reliability it's not an unreliable powertrain it's a supercharged v8 it's relatively simple R relatively it still has its problems however it's been rated as one of the most reliable jaguars which i know is an oxymoron but that does stand for something like it, it means something to be the most reliable jaguar it means like this car is actually you know a, a pretty good example of something you should buy if you want a car um, with high horsepower this package i think what deterred people from buying these cars because these cars weren't sold as much as i would have assumed because they're they're such a good package i think it's the trim levels also it was the fact that um they didn't uh any they didn't ever release a manual v8 they released a manual v6 but even that was in very rare numbers i couldn't even find one for sale so that could be another reason why people didn't gravitate towards this car it had the eight speed zf transmission which obviously is a good transmission however uh, back in the day when it came out, it, people weren't really thinking about the ZF being a super sporty transmission. Um, it kind of took BMW to like pioneer that in their M cars and to really take that risk to show people that, yeah, the ZF is a good transmission. Uh, it can replace a DCT. So I would say that this car is supremely undervalued, even when compared to what we were looking at this week. We were looking at um, GT500, ZL1s, and Hellcats, and this power numbers you know it's not as much power it's actually a little bit less than all the three however the prices are, are pretty much the same and you're not getting like a cheap american car this is like an up market example of of a of a vehicle like you have leather seats and all the creature comforts everything is nice and luxurious um so you kind of a it's a trade-off you know it's a little bit less power but not much it's 550 horsepower versus the zl1 has like 580 so and then the zl1's interior is not that great but this one's actually pretty nice with a bunch of different options yeah and we'll go through the options there are so many options for this it's ridiculous um and the fact that they change the way the packages work so often is super confusing and i think that really makes it hard to sell if i were to give one reason why this car isn't more popular it's because they messed up with the naming conventions of every single year it's ridiculous we're about to take a look though uh, but before that, let's uh, we'll go through the different uh, trim levels that were offered in each year because it's super, uh, super tedious. So 14 through 15. So 2014, 2015, you had the convertible 3.0 V6 340. So this is going to be uh, the 340 version. So this is going to be the low output V6. Then you have the coupe 3.0 low output version. Then you have the S convertible V6 with the high output. You have the S coupe V6 with the high output. So you have low output coupes low output convertibles high output coupes output convertibles for the v6 and then you have the vas convertible which is like kind of a little bit more but it's not as much as um the r so it's called the 495 but it has like 480 490 horsepower about things 488 mm -hmm. so you have that option and then you have the r coupe which had the five point or which had the full-fledged uh v8 so it had the R version that we see up here, not the SVR. The SVR came around in around uh, 2017, the SVR came about. So you're going to have that 550 horsepower, 542 um, for the top of the line spec for 14 and 15. 16, they decided they wanted to change everything. So they made um, 
they combined again the s coupe and convertible was a thing so the s coupe convertible uh, let's see all wheel drive actually hold on i don't know if i actually wrote this right because i don't see any base car here but i do see we'll just actually we'll just look at the we're on 2015 right or no 2016 because this part actually is a little bit confusing let me see if i can scroll down to where the what is going on here I'm tripping. Where did I? Oh, here. Okay. So I'll, I'll explain 2016 because 2016 is the only one that did it like this. F-Type S, Coupe, and Convertible available for 2016. Then you had the F-Type S all-wheel drive. So they started introducing all-wheel drive to the model ranges in 2016. So you get the all-wheel drive, Coupe, and Convertible. And then you have the F-Type R, Coupe, and Convertible. Um, so you have a two-wheel drive version of the S. You have an all-wheel drive version of the S, and then you have an all-wheel drive version of the R. There's no two-wheel drive version of the R for 2016. And what's also strange about 2016 is that you don't get the low-output version of the V6 at all for this year, which is really strange. I don't understand that completely, but as I mentioned, they did... Uh, oh, actually, no. I'm, I'm, I complete, This is why it was confusing. Sorry. Right here. I, um, I completely messed that one up. There is the whole... There, this is the base one right here. So they actually have seven different trim levels for 2016 which is really ridiculous so they have the low output coupe and convertible they have the high output coupe and convertible with those rear wheel drive then they have the all-wheel drive how high output coupe and convertible and then they have the coupe and convertible oh no so this is actually eight different trim levels for 2016. that's insane 2016 was a weird year for this car it it's uh it showed basically what confuses people is that they had the vas convertible and then in 2016, they got rid of the VS convertible. Uh, and then the, the S's were only reserved for V6s. So that kind of confused a lot of people, myself included. But as you can see, for 2016, there are eight different trim levels. You have low, low output coupes and convertibles. These are going to be rear-wheel drive. You have high output coupes and convertibles, rear-wheel drive. You have high outputs, coupes and convertibles. This is going to be all-wheel drive. And then you have the RV8 in coupe and convertible, which is always all-wheel drive. If you can uh, grasp that. Yep. So um, now let's move on to 2017 where they changed things yet again. So before, as you can see, each trim level came with a designated engine. However, when they came to 2017, then they decided that they wanted everyone to pick stuff like a la carte, right? So you're going to have the engines and then you have the trims and then you have the roof style. So the engines available in 2017 are the 3.0 supercharged V6, the 340, the low output and rear wheel drive, the 3.0 V6 high output and rear wheel drive slash all wheel drive. And then you have the 5.0 supercharged V8 550, which is going to be an all wheel drive. And then you have the SVR, which is going to be this last one. I believe the SVR is in rear wheel drive only. So 2017 saw the addition of the SVR engine, the highest output V8, the most desirable one, the one that actually holds value on like the rest of the model line. Um, and then for the trim levels for that year, for 2017, you had the F-Type, which is the base. Uh, this was also seen in this one, but I forgot to write it. Just F-Type, regular F-Type with nothing else. is just uh, the base model with the low output V6. And then you have Premium, which is that uh, plus some extras, but same low output V6. And you have the S, which uses the high output V6. Then you have the S all-wheel drive, which uses an all-wheel drive version of the high output V6. Then you have the R, which is the low output version of the V8. And then you have the SVR, which is the high output version of the V8. So those are going to be your trim levels um obviously when i when i mentioned it like this these engines kind of line up um but this is how they this is how they changed it on the brochure and i'll show you guys in a second you also had the roof style the introduction introduction of different roof styles aluminum roof this is going to be your standard metal roof you have a panoramic glass roof so obviously it's going to be panoramic glass you're going to be able to see out of it you have the carbon fiber roof which is just going to have carbon fiber you'll see it it's pretty obvious and then the convertible which is going to be a soft top and then finally, for 2018 through 2020 models, they introduced the i4 engine, the i4 turbo. So 2 liter turbo four, making 296 horsepower, they introduced. They also still kept the low output version of the V6 in rear wheel drive. Then they had the high output version of V6 in rear wheel and all wheel. Then you had the low output version of the V8, the R, and then you had the high output version of the V8, the SVR. So the trims, they dropped the premium uh, trim and the S trim for the 2020 um 
<laughs> for the 2020 2018 to 2020 models it's just f type which is the base and then you have the r dynamic and then you have the r and then svr so the f type base um is gonna you can get whatever engine you want in this car the base one i'm talking whatever engine in terms of four cylinder and six cylinder any one of those can go in the base car um but then you have r dynamic which is usually going to be the v6s and then obviously r and svr are going to be the v8s and then for the roof styles they are the same aluminum panoramic glass carbon fiber and convertible and then finally they were uh, i mentioned this before but they all came with an automatic zf8 speed there was a six speed manual available for the v6s from 16 to 19 however they were really hard to find and very desirable it's a shame they didn't make the v8 i mean the manual for the v8 i said su i suspect that has to do with some sort of packaging issue simply because you like it's very compact this engine and the five liter v8 is a really big power plant to have in a in a in a tiny car like this so um yeah if you can find a manual one i highly suggest to scoop it up just because of the rarity so let's get on to the part that uh that i'm dreading the options there are so many different things and they switch like on every different year it's ridiculous but yeah this is why it took me a little bit longer to get started today because um yeah you see how this well, let me just make this tiny because cause i need to fit two rows in here two columns all right we got that column then we got our packages and put that right next to it okay cool so these are going to be individual options i'm just going to read down them because uh there's no other way to get through them besides just reading down and hopefully like uh they are pretty descriptive so you understand what i'm talking about so we have the individual options here you have your paint color i'll show you your paint color in a second we're gonna go through all these and then i'm just going to pull up a brochure and then kind of scroll through it uh you know like side by side to show you wheel choice there are a ton of different wheels you have your brake choice there are three different brake options until the svr came out then it became four different brake options so you actually have different brake options that you can just choose no matter what you get in terms of car you have your top color for convertible and if you have a coupe you can get a power tailgate you also have the option to upgrade to a 770 watt meridian sound system it's gonna be a surround sound system switchable ex active exhaust so this, the exhaust is active by default, but you can get switchable active exhaust as a as an upgrade. Our F10 M5 is good. Uh, hey, shout out to you, man. Big Z in the chat. Haven't seen you before. Shout out to you. Our F10 M5 is good. I think the F10 M5 and the F06 M6 are some of the best deals on the market right now in terms of performance, luxury, and price. You can get a twin turbo V8, full luxury car. You can even get one with like fully loaded for under... 40 grand with like a, a good amount of miles like 40 50 000 miles like those cars are steals if you can get a good f10 m5 specifically a face did one an lci 2014 and up those are going to be some of the best cars if you find one that's been maintained properly obviously it has the s63 uh, i believe that's what it's called s63 i don't want to miss I, I really don't want to uh miss speak here s63 tu m5 yeah so the f63 tu is a good engine and it's funny because i actually made this mistake before i said that the pre-lci engine was not a tu engine and therefore going from a pre-lci to an lci um is a big upgrade in the engine but i'm actually wrong on that the non-tu engines were, were in the x5m um and the x6 those are going to be the non-tu engines those are going to be the most problematic ones and um, the TU, the S63 TU in the pre-LCI and the LCI really have marginal differences, very small differences. So, um, yeah, you're not really going to have a big reliability difference between a pre-LCI and an LCI. Um, I just suggest that you get an LCI because it'll be way nicer. What's the first mod you should recommend? All right. I'm going to have to do another F10 M5 video because I get a lot of questions about that car. Even though I did an F10 M5 video like a year ago, but I'll do another one. What first mod you should recommend? I don't know. Are you talking about like aesthetic or performance? For me, uh, I would do some type of, um, I get some downpipes. I get a tune. Um, you know, maybe cut out some of the exhaust. But usually downpipes are pretty good. I just like hearing that turbo whistle. And uh, downpipes are easy way to free up that, uh, easy way to let the car breathe a lot better. And you can make a lot of power. 
Okay, where was I? We're going back to this. Um, actually, I had this up. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Definitely, I'll make one of those. In fact, I'll do that next week. I'll make another F. I'll make a an F10 M5 one. Hey, Big Z, don't forget to join the Discord. If you um, if you're lucky, you could be the winner. I'm I'm giving away fifty bucks. I'm drawing on Monday. So join the Discord. All you gotta do is like the video, comment, subscribe to the channel, join the Discord, and you can win fifty bucks. Go for the B fifty eight. Yeah, I mean I did a video on the B fifty eight when I did the three forty. The B fifty eight is definitely one of BMW's best engines to date ever. Like it's such a reliable engine and you can tune it to anything. Yeah, so I mean, but unfortunately the B fifty eight is a turbo six engine. Um, I'm not, I'd always say get the, get the V8 over a straight six. I mean, I think the V8s are a lot cooler and it's twin turbo. I mean, obviously the, the V6, I mean, the straight six could be twin turbo or a single turbo, but the V8 is like a proper like sports car power plant. Like it shares that with everything else on the market. You know, twin turbo V8s are everywhere. In fact, BMW has one of the biggest twin turbo V8s on the market right now. 4.4 liter. It's pretty crazy actually. Anyway, so oh where was i here oh yeah so you have the switchable active sport exhaust if uh if you have the regular not or just regular active exhaust it comes on and off on its own when you hit certain rpms but then if you get the switchable one you also want to make sure that it works so that's another thing in problems you also have this choice of seats there are three seat choices or two seat choices and then the performance seat either is an svr seat or just a regular performance seat you have the sport seats and then you have the performance seat and then the r seat as i said and then you have all the different leather options you have. You have sport seats uh, with leather and suede cloth facing. So it has suede inserts as well as suede on the doors. And you have sport seats with all leather. And you have performance seats in premium leather um, for 14 and 15. The performance seats in premium leather after 15 just came with the extended leather. It was all one package. So performance seats in premium leather with extended leather. This means leather on top of the dash, on top of the doors. Um, you could also get the performance seats in premium leather and suede cloth. So you got, you know, suede into uh, suede, um, <laughs> suede pieces on the seat. I don't know. Suede accent. I, don't, I forgot the word I'm blanking right now. Anyway, um, 340 XI. Cause you can adjust the GF, uh, ZF. Yeah. I mean, the 340 XI is a really good car. I mean, it's going to, I think it's going to run you a little bit less in terms of running costs than the M5. You're going to be paying a lot less in gas and you're going to be having a more reliable car, but nothing can beat the V8 sound. I mean, the straight six sound is cool, but it's not that great compared to a V8 sound. Okay, moving on. And then you had the um, performance seats and leather and leather interior. So this included, so this was the premium leather performance seats and a leather interior, premium leather interior, which is an upgrade over the regular leather interior. Then you have the red leather interior pack, which just means leather seats with a black trim. You can also choose the seat trim color, the stitch color, the console trim material, choose the headliner material, the carpet color, and or the, yeah, carpet color. Um, and then you have also these standalone options down here, the suede cloth steering wheel, the carbon fiber center console trim, carbon fiber engine cover, wind deflector for the convertibles, a carbon fiber rollover protection system for the convertibles, so carbon fiber hoops behind your head carbon fiber mirror caps so your mirrors are going to look carbon fiber you're going to have uh, also for the next model your 2016 they offered the chrome mirror covers instead of carbon so you get either or or none painted um so you can get those carbon fiber hood louvers and again uh this goes with the problems i'll mention this in, again but you'll you want to know where your hood louvers are on the car because they do come in two different locations depending on the year Uh, I, don't, I think the V8 sounds better overall than a six cylinder in every way, shape, or form. <laughs> uh, so what was I saying? Um, yeah, carbon fiber hood louvers, carbon fiber side vents, carbon fiber front splitter blade, carbon fiber rear diffuser, exhaust finishers. It's for the V6 model only, so it's just a cool exhaust tip. Red brake calipers for 2016. You could change the brake calipers. This is 2016 is when they started offering colors. Uh, ceramic brakes 2016 plus for the r models you have the fixed rear spoiler on 2016 plus models as well um you could get a luggage set too this came for all model years if you have the luggage set that's pretty cool but not really that desirable no one really cares that much it's not a ferrari and then you also have the heated front windshield option available in 2017 
as well as the configurable, configurable dynamic mode in 2017. If you don't get the configurable dynamic mode, you just have dynamic mode, which is um, non-configurable, I guess. They, they choose the modes for you, but with configurable, dy configurable dynamic mode, you're able to customize it like other cars that uh, it competes with. And then finally, we have the packages. So if it doesn't have a date next to it, it means the packages were available for all years. It has, if it has a date, um, that means that's the single year. If it has a plus, that means it was that year on. So packages, design pack. So this came with the body colored front bumper, splitter, body colored aerodynamic splitters, body colored side still extensions, gloss black rear valence, body colored rear bumper diffuser. So if it's all body colored, it's gonna have the design pack. Interior black pack, gloss black air vent surrounds, door switch pack surrounds, flat bottom sport steering wheel. Just look for the flat bottom sport steering wheel with the gloss black trim. Uh, for that interior black pack uh the exterior black pack is a gloss black finish from front grille bumper beam front splitter so if it's not body colored and it's not carbon and it's black you have the black exterior pack in 2016 they introduced a vision pack which came with adaptive front lighting and cornering lamps with intelligent high beams front parking sensors rear parking sensors and reverse traffic detection rear parking camera blind spot monitor so all the safety stuff came on the vision pack not necessary but if you want the highest value car you should try to find one with the vision pack a lot of options there the climate package 2017 had heated seats and steering wheel um, this was also included in premium plus vision package so if you got the vision package and got the premium um <laughs> and you got the premium uh trim for 2017 that was uh, the equivalent of um of the climate package or not the equivalent, but the climate package was included if you got this premium plus vision package, which is its own package. I just didn't write it down because it was, it was kind of redundant. But premium plus vision is literally the premium trim with a vision package. And then you can uh, obviously uh, get this climate package is included with that if you get that. Anyway, in 2019, they introduced the climate pack two, which is a climate pack one, which is the original climate package plus a heated windshield. So it adds the heated windshield option. Um, from 2017 and 2019, they made that a full climate pack too. And then um, you could also get the extended leather package or the extended leather package upper environment only. So your choice. I believe the extended leather package comes with leather everywhere, even underneath, like under like the the bottom part of like your glove compartment and everything. An upper package just comes on the top of the doors. Um, exterior carbon fiber package. All those carbon fiber pieces I mentioned earlier, you can get them all in one package. So it's called a carbon fiber package. You can get the super performance braking package, which came in 2017. And this was basically it utilized this torque vectoring, but it was only available in 2017. Not sure why. The drive package only, also only available in 2018. The Windsor leather package only available in 2019. And the climate package in 2020 combined one and two. So they brought it back to one climate package for 2020. As you can see, what we've gone over so far is super, super complicated and really kind of like hard to understand. Jaguar, you really dropped the ball with this whole release of the car. You could have really like simplified this and made it a lot more easier to digest for people who are trying to get into this new brand or new vehicle, new model. And you really didn't help at all by making it so complicated. But let's get on to the problems because that's where this car shines. Honestly, is the fact that it's actually not that unreliable for what it is. You know, it's a Jaguar, high strong sports car. People are going to automatically assume that it's going to have problems. However, the power plant itself on even the both the V6s and the V8s, I didn't find too much information on the four cylinders, but the V6s and the V8s are, are, are not too bad. They're pretty robust power plants. These are going to be your issues that you're going to see usually um, no matter what. If you get your V8 or V6 or I4 car, you're going to have sticky buttons on the earlier models. So the earlier models, I believe it was uh, 20... It, it was either 2016 and earlier, 2017 and earlier. If it has a bronze starter button then it's going to have the sticky button issues. There's remedies for this. People have this cleaning solution that gets all the sticky stuff off the buttons. You want to make sure that the buttons on your car aren't sticky because that's a big issue. You really don't want to be dealing with that. The supercharger bypass actuator failure. So basically, if your car detects that something's wrong, it'll cut off the supercharger and it will make your car run naturally aspirated. So if that actuator fails, it basically simulates the something's wrong with your car and it shuts off the, shuts off the supercharger. You won't be able to drive with, power, with much power being limp mode. So... That bypass actuator is literally just a piece and it sits on top right next to the supercharger. Easy to fix. The fuel injectors seem to be a really big issue. Doesn't matter if you have a V6 or a V8. Um, let me get, take a sip of coffee. Doesn't matter if you have a V6 or a V8. The fuel injectors can go bad early. This is said to be because of the sound the car makes. If you haven't heard of uh, any F-type, a V6 or a V8, 
They are some of the loudest perform or the loudest stock cars ever to be released, like to the public. They sound insane. In fact, I got some video clips here. So let's uh, let's take a listen to some of the different uh, examples of F type. So we'll start off here. We have a V6. You see here it has quad tips though. A big difference between the V6 and the V8 is that the V6 has two center tips while the V8 has quad tips on the outside of the bumpers. You can see here that it has quad tips, but this is actually a V6 with the V8 exhaust swapped onto it. If you change the rear valence, like the rear bumper and the exhaust, it literally bolts right on. So if that's something you want to do, but obviously a big, that's a big thing between a V6 and the V8 is the exhaust. So if you kind of switch it, it's kind of, you're like kind of faking it almost, but let's uh let's take a listen. Do you hear those pops and bangs? Like that's from the factory. Obviously, this one has an upgraded exhaust system, but it popped and banged like that from the factory. And because of this, you often had like your fuel injectors would get gunked up and they would fail either getting stuck open or stuck closed. Um, you never want to have any issues with your fuel injectors. So you want to make sure that you get those looked at, make sure they are good and you don't have any type of like smoke coming out of your car at, under hard acceleration or anything like that. But let's listen to an, a V8 on the dyno because they sound a lot different. Did you hear that just popping? That's stock. And uh, yeah, that's probably why these cars destroy their fuel injectors and destroy the catalytic converters because of the whole the, the very team. Ooh, that's a good boy. We're not even gonna release some of first cylinder one. It's not even worth it. But a hey, shout out to Pass the Panner. Pass the spanner. I can't read. Um, yeah, pass the spanner. Fair use, fair use. I appreciate your video, man. All right, here we're doing a V8 or V6. This is going to be a Type S. It's going to be some outdoor sounds, so you can see what it sounds like on the outside. Just want to give you guys a quick example. Shout out to Gabor Shams. Shams. So it has a very typical V6 sound. Sounds kind of like an R35 or something. Kind of. But this is how it sounds. With those pops and bangs, it's insane. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy because like in California, they'll, they'll, they'll impound your stock car if it's in race mode. <laughs> Which is funny. <laughs> like You're not supposed to use race mode for the street. It came with the car, but nope, you're supposed to use it on the track. We're impounding it. You're not supposed to use race mode in the street. Are you racing? That's illegal. Anyway, so here we have a V8 uh, Type R, or Type R. We have a V8 F Type R, um, and you'll hear the outside sounds too. But this definitely sounds a lot better than the V6. This one has a Larini exhaust, so it's a little bit louder than stock. But I'm telling you, these sound crazy stock. Like they, just, they sound just as loud. Yeah, I'm telling you. Look, there you go. Here's your F10 M5. Sounds insane. You know, I don't know, Jacob, if it's better than the Maserati Quattroporte. That naturally aspirated um, Maserati V8 sounds so good. This one, it sounds, um, you know, it's loud, and but the fortiness, I feel like will get old after a while. So I wouldn't say that this, you know, it sounds better than that. The Maserati just has so much tone, tonality. 
it just sounds so good this one is very loud and aggressive and pops and bangs it sounds good but i don't know if it sounds better than that that's kind of that's a debatable point right there anyway i just wanted you guys to hear the sound sounds pretty good uh, but we'll get back to the other problems so we stopped on fuel injectors can go bad early yep because of the way it pops and bangs uh catalytic converters as well mentioned down here you also have issues with the coolant expansion tank leaking that is common with a bunch of different cars you have a hot engine with a plastic coolant tank that's usually put together by glue and that glue goes bad and it starts leaking or you could have cracks from over tightening the cap or a bunch of different reasons but the plastic becomes brittle it breaks you have to replace your coolant expansion tank Diff noise is a big issue with these as well, no matter if you're a V6 or a V8. If you hear like a groaning noise that increases with speed or like changes with the speed you're going, you probably have a diff issue. It's just going to be sounding like a humming noise or like a grind, a groan um, just behind your head. You really, you're going to only hear it when you're going fast and the, you know, the diff is moving fast. Supercharger coupler issues. So there's a piece inside. It's a supercharger coupler. If it becomes, if it fails, basically, it'll sound like marbles in a can with your supercharger. It'll be like rattling. Um, yeah, you don't want that to, to you know, happen because you don't want it to, you know, break off. And you don't want issues internally with anything. So if you hear noises like that, it's probably going to be your supercharger coupler. And, you know, get that fixed. Exhaust actuator, as I mentioned before, for the, um, for the exhaust, the switchable active exhaust, the actuator can sometimes go bad. And if it is... Uh, you'll be able to hear it because the exhaust will like kind of go by to make it flutter because it's not working anymore. And it makes like a rattling noise. So just listen to any fluttering, rattling noises when the car is idling. The trunk cover support, I wrote truck, but I meant trunk cover support. So basically the, the cover, it's attached by like these strings and they hook into the, to the tailgate. And those strings where they attach sometimes are like pulled out because of the trunk support. It's like holding up the, the trunk cover so you can hide your stuff. You want to make sure that the trunk cover support isn't being torn apart because they actually look like they're breaking. Um, trunk lining separation. This is a small issue that I just saw a couple of times. I just wanted to include it um, just as a basic, like, uh, just to, like, show that it's little things like this is what's going to go wrong with the car be the most annoying. So you're going to have this trunk lining separation issue, which is going to cause wind noise behind you. You're going to hear some random wind noise that's caused by the trunk lining. That, so basically... Um, so here's your trunk. It has deep walls. Like when you open up the tailgate, the walls of the trunk are really deep. And then so basically the lining where the, the edge of the panel goes into the place where the, where the, <laughs> where the tailgate sits, there's this lining. And if it becomes separated, air can get in there and make noise. And then finally, or not finally, uh, you have hood fitment issues. This is a clamshell hood. If you weren't aware, um, they open reverse. So if uh, the front of a car is right here, the hinge is in the front and it opens like this. Looks really nice. Looks really exotic. But you want to make sure that the hood lines up with the bumpers. As you can see, this fender right here. Oh, actually, you can't really see. Let me bring up a bigger picture. Oh, well, okay. Let me... Uh... That's not what I wanted to do. Um, let's look at an SVR. All right, I forget what I was even looking at. Oh, my God. oh yeah, foot, hood fitment issues. So, if you can see right here, it's hard to see, but the fender ends right here. This is the hood, and then you have the front bumper. These all have to line up for it to look good, and sometimes they don't because of the way this clamshell hood opens. So you got to make sure that this lines up right just to, you know, have some peace of mind when it comes to how well the car was taken care of. You want to make sure that no one's, like, taking body panels off often or stuff like that. So that is our... I keep bringing up that. I need to just exit out of this. Shout out to... Oh, I forgot his name, but his YouTube channel is, is pretty lit. He has some good discussions. Okay, cool. So we are... Pretty much done with oh yeah one final thing i'm pretty sure it's on like 16 or 17 or it could be 17 or 18 when the hood vent holes change from being up here on the hood to being like down here and the reason why they change the location is because water would get into the holes up here and because of where the holes were they would it would drop down into the engine area and kind of corrode your physical fuel injector so they get stuck inside the, the the block and then you have issues if you have your fuel injectors go bad you can't get them out that's going to be a big problem or they're going to break inside 
um or no, fuel injectors i meant yeah fuel injectors or coils ah, one of those two i'm sorry i can't remember i didn't write it down anyway but there's water if the hood vents are up near the front of the near the windshield those are the problem vents if they're up or down closer towards the end of the car those are going to be the ones that are uh less problematic but you'll see pictures so you'll be fully aware of what to look for so let's get on to the ads y'all's favorite part of the show where we go over different ads and i show you guys what to look for as well as what i think they should be priced as so our first example here we have a 2014 this is going to be a first model year remember all the first model years basically came in a convertible that was the release spec of the car it was a convertible and this one's a v6 as well so we can see convertible v6 car um what do they have to say about it robust v6 this has a low output power uh, let's see has nav memory sees backup camera okay so it has some options but it is a first model year with 45,000 miles it has a clean title so actually this is not too bad in terms of price 24 grand they're asking you know they're not too far off i'd say for being a first model year v6 uh, with only 45,000 miles, I'd be willing to go up to $19,000. Then moving on to our next example. We, oh, let me get a good, a good picture to start off here. Moving on to our next example, we have a 2016 F-Type Coupe. This one is also going to be a V6. It has 51,000 miles and is in the silver color with these black wheels. Actually, that reminded me, we never looked at the paint colors and the wheels. So let's do that real quick. Just I told you there's too much stuff to go over with this car. So here are going to be your exterior colors. They got a ton of different options. You basically get in any color. So these are going to be your regular colors. These are going to be your metallic colors. And then these are going to be your wheel options. A ton of different wheel options. You had 18, 19s, and 20 inch wheels for this car, which is ridiculous. Like, look, there's one, two, three, four, eight, twelve, seventeen 4, 8, 12, 17 different wheel options for the Jaguar. I don't know why they did that but you'll see a ton of different wheels on these cars i suggest going for 20 inch wheels simply because those are going to be the most premium i really like these rotor wheels uh, i haven't seen them that much or these um the storm forged alley wheels are good too i also like the blade ones but yeah just look for 20s that's what i would go with simply to have the best option to car but yeah, back to the ads you'll see i guess we'll go back and forth between this um gosh where i put the wheels so what wheels are we looking at here so we're looking at some five spokes it's gonna have a thick part and a thin part so the thick part and the thin part right here so we have the cyclone gloss black wheels so that's what this car is on the cyclone gloss black wheels a silver color see what the interior looks like we can see it has the old or this is the 2016 yeah we can see it has the old style button it's a little bit more on the bronze side but it's pretty worn, so you can't really see it. Sometimes you also see bronze paddle shifters, but I've noticed that some of the paddle shifters aren't um, in bronze. Also, we also forgot to do a bunch of things because I remember we didn't look at any type of interior stuff. These are going to be your seat options. As I mentioned before, the performance and the sports seats. I suggest going for ones with performance seats, but obviously the sports seats are good too. And if you have an R, you can get the R performance seats, which are in um, a two-tone color, but they are the same seats. They also have an embossment on the headrest. Um, yeah, these are going to be your leather trim colors. I didn't get to show you how the interior is specced out, but basically you get to pick the color and the stitch. So these are going to be your like common combinations reading left to right. So you can see you get brown leather. So this shows you different options. Brogue with ivory, jet with jet, but one is premium leather. Um, one has the premium leather upper fascia. Oh, so basically, sorry, I read this completely wrong. This is the seat, this is the upper fascia, and then you have the other materials here. But I mean, as you can see, this is super hard to decipher. Like <laughs> Jaguar did a horrible job with these brochures. They were so hard to read. Um, but yeah, those are gonna be your colors. There are a ton of different options. These cards basically can had be had anyway. So moving on to uh we already did this one. No, we were on this one. So 2016, they want 2894. It is a clean title and it has 51,000 miles. I'd say because it's a 2016 coupe, but it doesn't really have that many options. It has the regular seats, not the performance seats. Um, nothing really too fancy in here. It has the regular steering wheel. I'd be willing to go up to $25,000. Moving on to our next example, we have a 2016 F-Type R coupe. This is more of my speed, what I'd be looking for. 
you can see on the interior we have the two-tone performance seats with the r embossed in the headrest very nice interior spec also with the flat bottom wheel you can see the quad exhaust too because it is a v8 so 2016 you can see trunk pretty clean this is going to be that cover and these see the strings and where they attach to the trunk right here this is where all the issues come because it literally rips them out of the of the lid you can see the clamshell hood here with the supercharger they don't have the engine cover on it which is you know i always question cars that don't have the engine cover but you know you're gonna have to just figure that out and then you can see the wheels as well very nice example i like the two-tone seats i like the silver i like the wheels everything looks pretty good or white and i like the wheels We'll see what he has to say. 2016 F Type R. This one is going to be an all wheel drive model, 54,000 miles. It's the 5.0 supercharged, and they're asking 37.5. With 54,000 miles, you know, I'd say they're not too far off with 37.5 um, because it is an R. Those do command such a higher price because those are like completely different cars. I would be willing to go up to 34.5 for this car. Moving on to our next example, this is going to be one of the few four cylinder examples we look at and it's weird because they the naming convention for this car even though it's a pre facelift is using the facelift uh facelifted naming convention the p300 p4 p380 or p whatever as you can see it has the brown interior which is very nice with the leather on the door handles with the stitching you can see the leather on top of the dash as well. So it looks like it has the extended leather package. We have leather everywhere we can see. This is going to be that four cylinder engine though. So not really too desirable. This is just really something like, this is like more like a daily driver, like sports commuter car, if anything. Um, 2020 though, with only 22,000 miles, they want 40 grand for it. I'd say because it's a 2020, it's a nice new example with the new naming convention. It has some of the upgrades for being a new car. Plus, it has the brand new engine. I'd be willing to go up to $32,000 for this car. I really wouldn't want to pay more than that. Otherwise, I'd just get a V8 or a V6. And then finally, for Facebook, we have a 2017. This is going to be an F-Type R with only 9K original miles. Clean title with the two-tone red and black interior with the performance seats. Very nice. You can see the R embossed here. Of course, being an R, this car has the 5.0 liter supercharged V8 making 550 horsepower and, you know, around 516 pound feet of torque, something around there. So very potent car. Very good example. This one has the, where are those wheels at? Yeah, this one has the rotor forged alloy wheels, which I do like these wheels. It could use a little spacing to make the stance look a little bit better, but it looks all right to me. Also has red seat belts. Not a bad example. 42 grand they're asking, and it has only 10, not even 10,000 miles. You know, that's not too far off. It has a clean title, really low miles. They want 42 grand for this. I'd say I'd be willing to go up to 40 grand. I call it a day of 40 grand. If I can get this for 40 grand with under 10,000 miles, that's a pretty good deal. That's a good amount of car for the money. Plus, you'll have all that room to sell it. Um, obviously you're trying to sell it before it gets to 10,000 miles and it's going to take the depreciation hit when it hits 10,000, but you're going to try to price that in. That's why I said 40 grand and not 42 because 42, you know, is for a car with this low miles, you, you can definitely get in the forties. Then moving on to our next place. We look at ads. We have a 2015 F type S convertible with those wheels. We looked at earlier, actually. So scrolling down, we can see it has a black roof. It is a V8 S, so it's going to be a V8 car, even though it's an S, which is funny to me because every other S is going to be a V6, except for the convertible one, this one specifically. They never made a V8 S coupe. It was only a V8 S convertible. Let's look at the interior. We can see it has the regular sport seats, not the performance seats, round wheel, nothing too fancy going on here, as well as uh, you don't have leather cover. Actually, you do. Let's see. Yep, I mean, standard seats. You have leather stitching everywhere that it needs to be. Looks pretty good. As I mentioned before, those gold paddle shifters and star button. This is going to be one of those cars where you're going to see a lot of interior wear with those sticky buttons. As well as this material right here going around the wheel just wears like crazy. 
Yeah, I told this is what I was saying yesterday. I said this car is like good on paper, but the interior is just not that good. I think the exterior looks pretty good. I'm not going to lie, but the interior just doesn't do it for me. I don't know why, but this looks so basic and like, like there's no style. Like there's nothing cool about this interior. It's like, this is what like you tell a computer to design an interior to make like before creative AI, obviously this is like a very like binary way to make an interior. Obviously they have some little cues here like this little handle here but everything is just super basic like they didn't really try that hard to make it look anything unique uh the only thing that's pretty cool about the interior are these rising vents they actually pop out of the dashboard when you want but of course being a jaguar that is going to be a big uh, point of failure for these cars um but yeah i agree with you man jacob the the jaguar f type is not the best on the interior um that's probably also why it didn't sell as well um but yeah, a lot of different things holding this car back uh, that they could have easily fixed. Definitely having a better interior would have helped a lot. 27.9, they're asking. It has 70,000 miles. So this is one of uh, the higher mile examples we've seen so far. It is a V8S, so it's not going to have as much horsepower as an R. It only has 488 horsepower as opposed to having 550, which is kind of a big jump. So you're getting this car, but you're not really getting the performance that you expect out of the V8. Um, but it's still a V8. And it is a convertible type as they made it. So um, it's still, you know, a viable option to get. But at a discount, obviously, I'd say for having 70,000 miles, I'd be willing to go up to 25.5 for this car. Did they say anything? No, nah, of course not. Cool. Moving on to our next example. We have a 2016 F Type S. This is going to be a 2016. So it doesn't use the V8 anymore. This is a convertible type S, but it has a V6 supercharged obviously i picked this one because of the color i love the orange on the f-type it's one of my favorite colors for the f-type especially with this background i don't know where they're at but it just looks really good looks like florida um nope yep i was right it is florida see i got that eye you know i, I could i have this weird thing where i can look at a picture and i know like where in the in the world it is like i can just tell i don't know why but anyway florida's easy you can see the palm trees it's usually very flat and it's also a bunch of like this uh it's kind of red roofs type things but it's the palm trees and the lack of mountains that gives it away for florida it's also the lack of like sidewalks <laughs> there are no sidewalks in florida that's so random anyway um going back to this car let's look at the interior see what we're working with we have the performance seats with some cool color stitching it's not color contrast obviously because it's matching the paint you don't want to call it color contrast because color contrast stitching is technically stitching and doesn't match the outside paint um it is not contrasting with anything so this is color stitching so we have color stitched seats the performance seats it's 2016 so it's going to have the sticky button problem let's look at the hood vents i just want to point them out so you can see on this one it's a 2016 the hood vents are up here they're kind of in the middle and far back so on the later models they were moved to around right here just to fix that water ingress issue any other things we can see on this yeah just a bunch of cool stitching on this car this is a nice um Nicely spec car. I, I like this car a lot. The orange really does it for me. V6S, 71,000 miles, but looks really good for that amount of miles. I'm trying to see, like, I couldn't really tell. Like, the bolsters on the side of the seats look really good. I'd say for something like this, 71,000 miles, clean car on surface at least. They're asking $25,000. I'd be willing to go up to twenty three five. Like, I'm pretty close on this. 70,000 miles, 2016, 23 five. Um, for this spec because it is actually a really good spec if it was kind of more basic it has i mean this one has a performance seats it has a flat bottom steering wheel if it was more like a basic spec with the regular sports seats and a round wheel and not any cool stitching i'd be under 20 for this car but because this car is a nice spec um i'd give it um 23.5 and if it had a v8 that would be even better but yeah Let's see if we can find any better examples this is 2017 you can see it is in black the thing is it's <sighs> i could be naming all these packages i don't know if this is carbon fiber or not I think this is just the black exterior package. This one looks like it has the black exterior package, but I can't really tell. This diffuser looks black. The front splitter looks black as well. So I'm just gonna assume it's the exterior black package. You can see also being in 2017, the hood vents are moved. They used to be up here, but now they are moved down and out. So that way where the water enters, it actually gets uh, flowed away from the engine into the ground. You also have color. Uh, contrast stitching you have red stitching on the performance seats you can also see that even though it has 65,000 miles you can see some wear starting to accumulate on the bolsters regular stuff but you just want to make sure you keep track of it you don't want your seat bolsters looking horrible 
Um, you can see it has nav, everything. I mean, everything like that is standard with cars like this, which is why I like nicer cars. You get them for the same price as cheaper cars because they depreciate so much, but it comes with a bunch of more standard stuff. I don't get why people uh, don't buy more expensive cars. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy um, that the V6 sold so well, but you're right. I mean, that is a good point. The US, um, we like V6s. We don't only like V8s. We're not completely stereotypical. Um, a lot of cars do have V6s, and a lot of cars actually, the upper line of the cars are the V6, and the lower line are the four cylinders, like Honda and Toyota, obviously. Um, you know, of course, they made big V8 engines for Toyota, but back in the day. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess we, we like uh, the V6, especially with the F type. The V6 was way more popular than the V8. The V6 was everywhere. In fact, it's really, it's hard to find a V8 like on the road. Usually you always see the V6s. So uh, let's go back to this one. Looking on the interior, we can see it has the performance seats with the red stitching on the dash and the doors, but not on the seats themselves. It has, oh, actually, no. It has red stitching on the seats and white stitching, a two-tone stitch pattern on the seats. See, everything else looks pretty clean. It has the auto tailgate function, so that is a good option to have. I'd say because it's a 2017 with 65,000 miles, um, they're asking 36 grand. That's not too far off because it is a 2017, so you get the upgrades. I'm talking about the hood upgrade, plus a bunch of little things here and there. You don't have those sticky button issues with this car. I'd say because it has 65,000 miles, I'd be willing to go up to $32,000. Low 30s for any V8 is going to be a good deal. So try to get them in the low 30s, if not 30, if you're trying to get a V8 car. Don't pay over 30 for a V6 car. Just don't. <laughs> They're pretty reliable, so you don't have to get a low mile one, like an under 10,000 mile one to enjoy it. You can get a 30, 40, 50,000 mile car, and it will still be okay. Like this car, these cars aren't as bad as people think. Here we have a 2020. This is going to be F-Type with the four-cylinder engine. I thought we... I guess I don't know why I picked this one. Anyway, this is another P300. They were called P300s in the United States. However, um, they don't say that on any brochures. It's literally just a United States thing. But as you can see, it looks pretty nice. Like, this is a nice car to have for like... I don't know how to describe... If you're maybe rich and you want to give this car to like your kid, this is like a good starter car, like a good starter sports car. It's a four-cylinder, but it looks really cool. Um, you're not going to get in too much trouble, but it just looks the part. Like, tell me this doesn't look good. I think the F-Type is one of the best looking little coupes available right now. Especially with the facelift. The facelift looks even better. Um, but here, we can see the standard seats. Wait, I'm actually, these are the standard seats, right? 2020, the 2020 have different seat options because, uh, I mean, they look like the standard seats. But this is what I'm talking about, like, Jaguar, like their brochures and everything are so like inconsistent, like nothing matches up. The years don't match up. It's like me just like, yeah, I guess these are the standard seats or what is this? It's some sort of pack. Oh, this is a checkered flag. Okay. Gosh, I am. Uh, this is too much. I'm sorry. I do this live. So this is a lot. You know, I've got to memorize all these different packages. There's like 20 different packages in this car. Anyway, so this is the uh, F type checkered flag. I've. Oh, wait. I believe. Because it looks like this and has a checkered flag. I'm not tripping, right? I'm not tripping, right? Yeah, it is a checkered flag. So the checkered flag was a special option package. As you can see, I didn't even mention it because I just glossed over it. I didn't even think that we were going to find one. But we have a checkered flag edition right here. Let me just read to you what the checkered flag entails. So F-type checkered flag edition standard features. A choice of the I-4 or the V-6. Convert convertible convertible or coupe rear wheel drive or all wheel drive so you can basically have your checkered flag in anything but v8 the exterior is available in caldera red that's what this one is in the checkered flag has extended stills um versus exterior black design package um 20 inch six uh split wheels so these are going to be those wheels and then the interior of ebony windsor leather with pimento red or citrus stitching ebony suede cloth headlining Okay, cool. So you just have a really nice setup in terms of like options. I'm trying to see where the seats are, man. Cause like, how are you going to change up the seat? Okay. So I guess in 2020, it got new seats, but are there like performance seat options? Uh, I don't know. I, I haven't seen any performance seats for 2020. So 
we're going to stay with that for 2020 they took away the performance seat for some reason which is my favorite seat if you want to get a car i highly suggest getting the performance seat it looks the best and it, it just simply will add that much more value to your car so 2020 checkered flag edition with all the right things you know very nice car for someone who wants something that looks cool but isn't necessarily very fast 13,900 miles 14,000 miles they want 38 for it i'd say because it's a 2020 granted this is a brand new like this is a new car when compared to a 2014 or 2015 this is like really updated and is not really not going to have many problems at all everything major has been kind of sorted except for the engine specific problems but it's not that high strung it's a two liter four cylinder you're not going to have big problems like a supercharged v8 so um you know for that that uh, makes it a little bit more viable as a purchase so, but you know not for me obviously but i'm just saying in general like i'm just trying to rationalize why someone would actually want to buy this four-cylinder f-type coupe which they actually sell yeah alcantara for the seats is also available that's what the suede cloth is so they have the inserts um you can get performance seats or sport seats with suede inserts you can also get suede or alcantara on the headliner you can get it on the door panels you can get it on top of the dash you really can get it anywhere um they really uh, made it very customizable but yeah for this one being a 2020 with only 14,000 miles i'd be willing to go up to 34 5 for it i really wouldn't want to pay more than that it's a four cylinder but 34 5 would be a really good deal for something like this it's pretty much brand new and you're really not going to have that many problems with it we can also see because it is a four cylinder i don't know they relocated the hood holes back to the top so they really can't make a decision yeah suede alcantara it's like they call it suede um in this car but when in, in practice, Suede and Alcantara are like 95% the same. And then finally, we have uh, the best addition, the best trim level you could get for this car, the SVR, the one everybody wants. So as you can also tell by looking at it, it has a slightly different look. This part right here is slightly different. The front bumper is slightly more aggressive as well as the rear. You also have this spoiler. But the SVR is what makes the full power 575 horsepower coming from this V8 supercharged 5 liter engine. And on the interior, we can also see the seats have a really cool pattern. This is a 2020, so it's going to have those new style seats. You see all the new switch gear too. No sticky button issues for the 2020. This one does not have a flat bottom steering wheel. What's interesting is that no SVR actually came with a flat bottom steering wheel. They all came with round steering wheels. It was unavailable for the SVR, which is if interesting. I'm not sure why, but as you can see, the stitching pattern continues onto the doors as well. Very nice. You can also see the Alcantara headliner. So this thing is pretty much fully optioned as it should be because it is an SVR. Most of these things come standard. So you pretty much know what you get with the top of the line models. I'd say this is way overpriced though 86 grand is a ton of money even though it is a 2020 model and it only has 30,000 miles this is like really expensive you know i don't think someone would with 86 grand this would be their choice of car i think they gravitate to something else but if i were to price this having this low miles you know i really wouldn't want to go over 80 grand i don't know that's just an arbitrary number at this point because i really wouldn't spend more than like 40 grand on an f-type I'll try to get an SVR for under that. I'll get a higher mile one, not a 3,000 mile one. Do I like these? I like these. I like the V8. Uh, I like the R. I think the R is a really good value. Um, 550 horsepower. This has 575. This one looks cooler, obviously, but the R is a lot cheaper. I think these are good. I think they're really good value. The only thing I don't like about these, as I was saying earlier to Jacob, was that these, the interiors, this one is a 2020, so the interior has a little bit more flavor. But let's say, uh, we'll go back to like a 2017. The interiors just are so like, they're just so meh. They're just like so mid. The interiors are... are <laughs> I was going to say these interiors are like are Margot Robbie because they're mid. There's not there's nothing special, but Margot Robbie isn't mid. Everyone's just bugging with that. But I mean, this car, you know, it could be better. It's not bad, but it's like... I, I You're comparing it to a BMW or Mercedes. This is like bottom tier. There's nothing inspirational about this interior. It doesn't look that great to me. Um, yeah, there's nothing special about it except for maybe this thing, but whatever i wish they offered like a lot of cool interior colors i think that would really brightened up the interior made it a lot better they do offer interior colors but nothing in terms of like changing the leather like on the dash and stuff what do you <laughs> what are you talking about testosterone <laughs> 
What are you talking about? You don't get testosterone. You better go find some. Anyway, so for this one, I said 80 grand. It has 3,000 miles. This is basically brand new. 80 grand is the most I pay for this type of car. So this one's really nice. Really good example. Clean, obviously. It has 3,000 miles. You really can't go wrong with something like this if you have the money and you want an SVR. I mean, it is a flex. I'm not going to lie and say that having like a Jaguar isn't like a cool car, especially an SVR, no matter what, like an XK, XKR or whatever, like the last generation, the XKR. I'm not a big Jaguar guy, as you can see, but the, the R version of that is super nice. Like that car looks really cool. Hold on, let me just look it up. Jaguar XKR. Yeah. And then they have the XKRS. So that's that's like the SVR version. And this is more like the R version. So let's look at the XKRS. So you can see this is like this is a cool car. It's same uh five liter supercharged engine, I believe. But just really, really good performing car. And it looks kind of cool. Like you don't really see cars that look like this. This is kind of in the same class as like my BMW M6. A 2010 M6, like there's nothing that, lo that looks like that. I just want to look at it. I don't really care. Uh 2010 BMW M6. I just miss this car so much, man. Like, it's weird though, because when you're looking at these online, you're like, eh, they look okay. But in person, like this, these this round curviness, it makes it look like something like a UFO or something like that. Man, I miss mine so much. <laughs> Damn, that looks so good to me. Anyway, let's get back to the Jaguar. So let's move on to Auto Trade or. Let's move on to car gurus, the final place we look at ads. Here, our first example, we have a 2014 with uh, how many miles? 50,000 miles. Here, our first example, we have a 2014 F-Type S V8. So this is going to be the V8 uh, convertible version with a little bit less power than the R. You can see it is in white with the red interior. It looks pretty cool. Let's, uh, well, if this wants to blow up. There we go. So scrolling down, let's take a look. You can see the quad tips because it is a V8. However, you, you got to remember that. It didn't have the full 550 horsepower of the R. This was a Type S. Looking on the interior, we can see this one has a little bit more going on in terms of color, which is pretty cool that someone actually like stepped outside the box with their interior spec. Most of them, as you could see, were all black, which is so boring. Like, I don't know if it's like the people who optioned the cars, people who bought these cars were boring people, but this is better spec. This is something that I like with these red accents. You can also see the red going around the entire windshield, which is pretty cool. Yeah, the clean uh, clean whips is right. They, these are some of the best sounding cars from the factory in terms of like aggression and like just loudness. Like no other car really sounds this loud from the factory. I don't know how Jaguar got away with it. But I know that as the model years went on, the cars got a little bit quieter because of emission stuff. So you want to, uh, you know, keep that in mind. The 2014 and 15s are going to be the loudest, rawest versions of the car. But let's take a look at the interior again we can see the red accents we have the red and black two-tone handle as well as the red surround for the windshield we got red accents on the doors too with the red seats red performance seats interior looks really good as you can see we got leather on top of the doors as well which is starting to show a little bit of stretching or shrinking you can also see the convertible top has a little bit of wear as well a lot of people need to realize this is just a sidetrack that if you have a convertible you have to store it with the top up don't store it with the top down. Don't park your car in your garage with the top down and just leave it there. The top has to stay up when you're in like its resting position. Obviously, you can have this top down if you're out and about and driving around. But you want to make sure that um, you leave the top up or else you're going to end up with these wrinkles. And they're hard to get out. I mean, you could like steam them out, obviously. But if you just leave the top up when you're not using the car, it will not wrinkle as much. How many miles does this car have? Yeah, 50,000 miles. It shouldn't be that wrinkly. This car looks like it's been sitting outside most of its life with the top down. <laughs> um, actually, that doesn't make sense because then it wouldn't have any wear because it was top down. Anyway, I think that... Um, what was I going to say? Dang, I did it again. I had a little brain for it. I do that a lot. I need to focus, man. <laughs> for this one, let's scroll down a little bit. What, what, what does the guy have to say about this car? 5.0 supercharged V8 engine, 495 horsepower, 460. Uh, so, okay, so yeah, he has the V8 specs right here. It has the blind spot assist, red brake calipers, did the windows. Oh, yeah, I was talking about the convertible top. So, yeah, when you're when you are driving a convertible, it's recommended that you obviously put up your convertible 
top when you park it but don't put it up and down like all day like every time you park it put it up again put it down again put it up again put it down again it's gonna wear out your convertible top prematurely you want to probably just put it up and down once every time you take it out so if you're going to take it out on a sunny day put down the top when you leave if you park the car you can leave the car with the top down obviously just don't leave stuff in the car but just leave it with the top down the only time you should really fold is you have to and then when you put it back in your garage or you come back home then put the top back up so you minimize the amount of usage the top has but you also uh, minimize the uh the wear as well so uh well it's kind of same things this one having a red interior you know that has a lot going for it also the fact that it is a v8s you know it, it kind of bridges the gap between the v6s and the r in terms of power it's right there kind of in the middle so it's it, it's a good uh you know example of something you could get that makes good power but won't break your bank like a v8 might you know it's a little bit you can ask for a little bit less i'd say you shouldn't pay this much though i don't think you should pay anything in the 30s for a v8s convertible especially because they're going to be the earlier model years 14 and 15 i think for this one specifically having 50,000 miles i'd be willing to go up to 29.5 for this example simply because the spec is really unique and nice compared to the rest of the ones we were looking at and then moving hey shout out to the five people in the chat man if you haven't said anything already say what's up contribute to the chat say hi i'll, I'll say hi back <laughs> so here we have a 2018 this is going to be another four cylinder car you can tell by these tiny wheels don't ever get these wheels i just brought this up to show you guys an example of wheels i really don't like look how small they look they look kind of gross they look almost like uh this almost looks like if you kind of cross your eyes or make your eyes blurry it looks kind of like a model three in terms of the, the wheels um anyway so you can see another characteristic of the four cylinder i forgot to mention is that is it has a single exit exhaust the v6 has a dual exit center exhaust this one has a single exit center exhaust the v8 has a quad tip exhaust on both sides but as you can see these tiny wheels tiny brakes which yeah he needs to go uh take that out for a drive or something because rotors look a little strange you can see that this has the sport seats with the alcantara so this is going to have that suede and leather mix which we're talking about but these are going to be the sports seats the base seats what else do we see here yeah pretty much base interior nothing going on here we got a round steering wheel not even a flat bottom steering wheel but again this is a base car it only has the four cylinder engine this would be something that you get if you want something nice but not very fast but i don't know who really drives those um maybe like some girls or something they want something like this because they don't really care about the power but it only has twenty two thousand miles and they're asking for 34 grand i'd say that's not too bad that's 20,000 miles so it's a low amount of miles but 34 is way too high for a four cylinder i might as well as i mentioned get a six cylinder or even an eight cylinder for this price i'd say for me i would be willing to go up to twenty eight thousand dollars for this car then moving on we have a 2015 f type r this is something i wait <laughs> no way man hold up <laughs> is it the same one goodness gracious no this is in alabama so how many miles does this have Seventy thousand. this has nine thousand. okay different cars i was worried there for a second so here we have a 2015 f-type r coupe rear wheel drive with seventy thousand miles so a high mile example however the price should reflect that let's take a look at the spec we got the rotor wheels some of my favorite wheels for this car looks really good so far v8 as you can see it has the quad tips trunk looks all right you don't see any separation here that might be a shadow nope you do see the separation actually this is what i was talking about earlier the separation of the trunk lining is starting to come out so you want to make sure you address this it's going to just make a lot of extra wind noise all you got to do is just glue it back to the wall you can see on the inside it comes with the performance seats with contrast stitching on the seats themselves you can see it on the dash as well Let's take a look has the flat bottom steering wheel because it is an r as i mentioned before the svr doesn't come with the flat bottom steering wheel but the r does same with the high output version of the s they both come with the uh, flat bottom steering wheel yeah that's what i'm saying especially the four cylinder one but i don't know you really don't see a lot of them rolling around on the roads and um uh, to me the biggest issue with this car is just this the center console situation but I think also why the, why men specifically don't want to, well, I don't know if that's a true statement, what you said, but why men could be deterred from this car is that they never made a manual V8 version. They barely even made the six speed manual or the six cylinder manual versions. I couldn't find any for sale. So yeah, if they made a manual V8 rear wheel drive, cause it was weird. They had V8, they had V8s 
um rear wheel drive for 2015 and i think 2016 but then they dropped it in 2017 all v8s are all wheel drive which kind of is like it's not as fun so they kind of shot themselves in the foot by doing that as well jaguar shot themselves in the foot like 30 times with this model unfortunate um not sure like it seems like this is like the type of thing where it's like have you ever seen like a company where they get like new management every six months and like they just keep always like churning people and things keep changing and it's like you guys are wasting your time um like this is kind of what it seems like with this car like they're whoever like was in charge of the f-type and its focus of direction <laughs> probably was changed i don't know i'm just guessing i could i could look it up honestly but it's like why did they change the what <laughs> right exactly that's true midlife prices car yeah that's pretty much what this is at this point but they just didn't make it like cool enough to appeal to the people that would have bought it if they did <laughs> Anyway, this one, it has these uh, basic seats, nothing too fancy. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It has the performance seats. So it has the performance seats, flat bottom wheel. It is an R. So this is pretty good off the bat. It has 70,000 miles and they want 32 for it. They are not off by far at all. I'd say for having 70,000 miles, this would be something that I'd look at personally because I think that like if I could get an R under 30 grand, that would be a really good deal in terms of value. Um, a lot of car for the money. So if I can get this for 29 grand, um, I would do that. I think that would be a really good deal. Under 30 grand for a nice R. Um, you know, you could find one with a little bit less miles than this one, but it does look pretty clean. It has a kind of a good spec. It's black with the rotor wheels, has the um, it has the performance seats. So because of all that, I'd be willing to go up to $29,000 for this car. Then moving on here, we have a 2020 P340. So as I mentioned before, it was weird. In 2020, they started using this weird naming convention in the United States specifically. So this P340 is literally just the low output V6, uh, supercharged V6, three, making 340 PS around a little bit, give or take. I don't forget if you give or take with horsepower compared to brake horsepower. One of, one of the two is bigger than the other. But 2020 V6 is going to be the low output V6. So nothing too fancy going on here. This is only one step above the four cylinder, but as you can see, it is a V6, so it has a twin uh, center pipes. It's also on these wheels. Take a look at what we're working with on the interior. It is a 2020, so you get the new style seats, and these ones are in brown as well. I really like the way this interior looks with these new seats. Um, I think that uh, the new seats actually really, they added a lot to the interior. They brought it up, not as much as it could have been, but they literally did a good job. What do you have to say, Clean Whips? He said, better than the M5 for under 30 grand? No. <laughs> the M5 is literally going to be the best deal. Um, you can't beat the M5 for 30 grand, especially if, <laughs> yeah, you can't beat it. If you get an F10 M5 for 30 grand and you get an LCI, you can't beat it. That's literally what I say is the best deal on the market right now. Also, uh, side note, I think the best supercar deal on the market right now, if you're, if you're curious, is the Audi R8 V10 with the S-Tronic. That is the best deal for a supercar, the Audi R8 V10 with the S-Tronic meaning 14 and 15 specifically because they have the dual clutch. You're basically getting a detuned Huracan for half the price. You can get them for in the 90s, even in the 80s, if you can get lucky. In the 80s for a dual clutch V10, naturally aspirated, like you can't get that anywhere else. Such a, a dope combo and a lot of people are sleeping on that. But yeah, for the F10 M5, one of the best values right now. So for this one, having a really nice interior spec, I really like it. The brown, I'm a sucker for brown leather, especially the brown two-tone. It just looks good the way they did it, how the brown is on the driver's side and you have the black on the passenger side and it kind of wraps around here. I like the way they did it for the 2020 model years. It looks like for 2020, they offered some extra options. Uh, no, the Hellcat, I don't think is a good value at all. I think the Hellcat is a horrible value. I think the Hellcat is a lot of fun, but it's not worth 60 grand. I think that is a, a 35 to $40,000 experience. Um, but I don't know, man. You, you could value a little bit more. I think the experience is just lessened in the Hellcat because the interior quality is not there. Um, you know, it's weird. I need to start ranking this stuff because I think about it a lot, but I don't really know how to comparatively think because these are ap comparing apples to oranges. Because, like, if you're in something like this, like, the interior on this, I think, is way nicer than a Hellcat. But uh, I don't think that the, this is a better driving experience than the Hellcat, obviously. But the interior experience is way better. So I need to start, like... I'm going to start doing like a score of my own. I'm going to talk about like the interior experience, driving experience, make kind of scores like that. Cause um, I got to do something um, to compare all the models. Cause everyone always asks me what I think about this compared to that compared to that. And I'm like, I don't even know, man. I haven't thought about it. So I'm going to do, uh, that's going to um, come up. 
Jacob said that's why I always get back to the fifth uh, gen Quattroporte. Yeah, I mean you can get um, man, what what's the top of the line Quattroporte? I'm forgetting the trim level, but it, it looks really cool. Man, hold on. Let me see 2011. What's it called? It's like the S, and then there's one above it, right? GTS. Yeah, Maserati GTS. I could. GTS. Yep. The Sport GTS. If you can find a Quattroporte Sport GTS, those are super dope cars. And they're so rare. And the prices aren't even that high. They're like 20 grand for a Sport GTS Maserati. Mm -hmm. And there's like fully loaded with all the race stuff too, with the nice suspension. Like if you can find a Maserati Quattroporte Sport GTS, those are also really good. Obviously, the reliability is going to be kind of questionable. And parts are probably going to be a little bit more expensive if you're trying to like replace parts a lot. But Maserati Quattroporte Sport GTS is also a really good deal. I'm going to make a, a list of all the really good deals and kind of break it down by price ranges so you guys can get um, more value. And it won't be a live stream, or it might be a live stream, but I, I feel like more people will watch or an edited video than a live stream. It takes a certain person to watch a live stream. But I like doing live streams because I can talk with you guys. That's the whole point. Like, I remember I was talking um, I was talking to Karthik. This guy helped me out the channel. Uh, shout out to Karthik, by the way. I was talking to him. He was like... Um, Wow, I just had a break. God, yo, I'm having problems, man. I read the chat, and then I forget what I'm saying. Oh, you're saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically what I'm saying is that I do it live to interact with the chat, but obviously I know that all my videos that I pre-record just get a whole lot more views. So I don't know how I'm going to do that. I think I'm, I might just end up doing, because I want to add more days to, to the content. You know, like I'm missing uh, Saturday and Sunday. Obviously, I don't do any content on the weekends. I probably might not live stream on the weekends, but I might upload edited short, like 10 minute videos uh, for different things that I think about um, that are kind of in this format, but just edited. So they're really easy to digest. I might try to start getting on that. But the problem is like, I have no time to do this. Like it's crazy how much time this takes just streaming every day so uh it's really hard to add things to my schedule like what i have to do already by myself i have to write down my notes and this takes hours right i have to do endless research because yeah i know about the car but i don't want to say wrong things because it's live like once you mess up it's it's messed up you know and if you don't correct it people are going to think that uh you, you're just spewing wrong information which is the biggest the hardest part about doing this is that the misinformation like i'm trying to get this exactly right for y'all um but yeah i just <laughs> it only gets better but as i was mentioning um yeah the, the time thing is hard so trying to figure out how to make this extra stuff is is a little bit difficult right now but it will get done i promise like yeah I'm, i'll be able to get it done um oh yeah we we did not finish this sorry i got it. that was a huge sidetrack anyway forty one thousand dollars are asking for this it is a base v6 car so it has 340 um 340 it's around 335 horsepower with twenty seven thousand miles I say because this is a 2020, it has the upgraded interiors, obviously going to have a bump in the price, but for $41,000, no thank you. I'd say for having a base V6 engine, this should be worth around $33,000. And then our final example, we have another SVR, 2017 SVR with 12,900 miles. This one is going to be in all black. It looks really good in all black. Looking on the interior, we can see that this has Alcantara on the center console as well as carbon fiber. You can see the stitching also on the steering wheel as well. Hey, I appreciate that clean whips. I got y'all, I promise. Car, car content's never gonna stop. This is literally my passion. And it's crazy because I started this channel years ago and I did this kind of style of video years ago, but then I was like, nah, I really don't feel like doing this anymore. Like, I don't know if this is what I wanna do. And I went and did a whole bunch of other things. I did crypto, moved to Miami, I worked for, with Fresh and Fit, you know, started my own podcast, I did all that stuff, and now I'm coming back to what I actually like is this car stuff. It's like with the podcasting, like having girls on the shows and everything, that's so stressful. This is actually something I like doing, so I don't think I'll ever stop. Um, but yeah, it's funny that I actually came like full circle right back to what I was doing three or four years ago. If I just stuck it out, I could have been way further along and probably uh, would have been at that level of the people I was working with anyway. So... The key, the point of that is stay consistent with whatever you're doing. Things compound after a long time of consistency. They don't compound immediately. And it's funny, I'm actually just now seeing this with my videos. They come in like number 63 or whatever. The views are starting to like slowly starting to become exponential. Like they're like kind of flat 
and then the curve is starting to slowly show so i'm just if i keep doing this and slowly improving the quality and making it better and better i hope that one day this stuff will blow up and obviously this content isn't for everybody so i don't really expect my live streams to blow up like that but and i'm talking about like when i condense it because another plan i have is we're going to do a clips channel where we upload reels and shorts where i take the live streams obviously i have reels you see them on instagram you see them on tiktok but i don't uh i want to have like 15 20 minute videos that kind of condense the buyer's guides for people that don't have the time to watch a live or don't really care to participate um so yeah we'll just restart this one so here we have a 2017 f-type svr with 13,000 miles let's take a look at the interior specs here we're working with off the bat looks very nice it has a diamond quilted pattern on the seats as well as the alcantara on the dash as well as having carbon fiber on the center console so pretty much fully loaded off the bat we can see yep nothing too fancy in terms of the interior leather color however the stitching is there it is white stitching color contrast stitching you can see it going up the right side of the center console you can also see, see that you can also see that svr badge right here which is pretty cool let everyone know what we're in also looking at the seats again the diamond stitching really adds again the diamond stitching really adds a lot of character to these performance seats along with the svr badge not sure if these were done custom but they look very nice let's see if the does it show the door panels at all yep it is matching the door panel so i do believe that this was a factory option this also has the illuminated door sills which is a big option to get to i forgot to mention it but this is a thing illuminated door sills um they just add to the value but yeah the carbon center console diamond seats again we don't see the cover on the supercharger not really sure if the svr didn't come with the cover or the cover is just missing and then we have two keys and some books yeah this looks like such like a new aston martin vantage it's crazy i didn't even realize that until today honestly i was like wait a minute am i looking at a f-type or a vantage i'm not sure about the proportions though i believe the f-type is smaller than a vantage but the, the vantage is it looks big in pictures but it's deceptively small like the new vantage looks so much bigger than the old v8 vantage but they're only like two or three inches apart in terms of length and width is like two inches it's very marginally bigger but it looks a lot bigger probably because it just has a higher waistline um but yeah i'm going on the tangent again so for this one v8 svr top of the line spec we got diamond stitching on the interior we got just uh carbon fiber everywhere uh, as i mentioned before it, it as i mentioned before it is an svr so they don't have the flat bottom steering wheel which is really weird to me because they have it on the r and the the v6 s model but for this one 76 grand it has 12,000 miles i mentioned before for the 3,000 mile one i didn't want to go over 80 grand because it had 3,000 miles um, because this has 12,000 miles i really wouldn't want to go over 69,000 dollars so that wraps it up for today i think if i were to say which car you should get i think you should get the earliest model um the earliest model type r you can get so what i mean by that so let's go back to the features options and problems so the v8s came out um the r coupe was the top of the line for 2014 and 2015 i don't suggest you get this one i suggest you get the r that came out underneath the svr so it's being pushed down by the svr in terms of price but you're still getting a newer car um you, say if you got a 1415 um v8 or r coupe that's gonna be the top of the line car so people are gonna expect to get more because yeah I have the top of the line version of the car no other version was higher than this so if you get a v8 uh, with the uh, V8 2017 or later, it will be underneath the SVR in terms of price, uh, starting off from the factory. So you have a little bit more margin to work with there in theory. Um, I also think that the 2017s are going to be just a lot more reliable. They have some of the earlier problems that are fixed. As I mentioned, the 2017s are going to have relocated holes in the hood to not dump water onto the engine and potentially affect uh, different components, electrical components, mechanical components. Um, so yeah, I suggest getting a 2017 uh, F-Type R. That is the ideal one for me. Try to find one. I don't suggest getting a really low mile one. These cars, they were, you know, they would be, uh, they they handle, I mean, they handle abuse pretty well. Like they're pretty much like bulletproof. It's a five liter V8 based on a Ford engine. It's like not too bad in terms of, uh, you know, complication. And it's pretty reliable overall when compared to other cars in the segment. I'd say what would be its closest competitor? I mean, honestly i'd say the closest competitor would be like a 911 i don't know what else like that's a good question though i never really like i thought about it as a 911 but the 911 is a lot different than this car this car is kind of more brutish the 911 is more calculated um i'd say hmm, it, 
I I would com I would compare them with what we went over today, like the American supercars. I mean, American muscle cars. I think this is like a British muscle car, and I do believe that British people do have like a little bit of American in them because they are actually like like we have their blood in in us as Americans, you know, because <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. So they also like this muscle stuff. They just do it a little bit differently. And so this is their version of a muscle car. So I do believe that maybe you could compare this to like an AMG, but I don't know what AMG coupe uh, besides like the C63 you could compare it to, but I don't believe that they're kind of on the same level. The C63 is like a everyday commuter car. <laughs> um, but uh, the Ford Capri, I don't, oh, is that, was that like a muscle car back in the day or something? Um, but yeah, I suggest I, I would say that this would be comparable to like an AM, like maybe a CL sixty three coupe, maybe with like the the P the whatever the performance package, something like that, um, would be pretty comparable to this. But yeah, this is pretty much very uh, muscly SL coupe. Maybe I'd say the SL is a little bit more soft than this car. This car is uh, a little bit more hardcore. The SL is like really like an old man's car, like <laughs> it's built for like eighty plus year olds. Um, this one is a little bit more youthful, especially in the styling department. The S the SL is one ugly car, especially the new one, not the new one, the new, new one, but like a 2018, that thing is ugly, man. I reviewed one actually on the channel. Um, you can go check out that review. I did it in Miami. Um, yeah, the car is cool. I did a 450, so it was a V6, but it was not like this, like the Jaguar F type is like a sports car. The, the SL is like a GT car. Um, like super GT, no no sport there. It's just GT. Um, so yeah, 2017 V8 is what I'd recommend. If you really want to get the cheapest one, obviously you can get a V6. I recommend staying away from the 14 specifically because I was the first model year and they only came in convertible. Not really a big fan of these in convertible. It really robs your trunk space. Shout out to Jeremy Clarkson on Top Gear. If you remember when he reviewed the convertible version of the F-Type, it had like this much trunk space and it was like this deep. It's like this. You can like put like a little bag in there, maybe like a purse laid on its side. You can fit it in there with the top down. Obviously, with the top up, you have a little bit more space. But like with the top down, you had room for maybe like a Gatorade bottle. It was pretty ridiculous. Um, so yeah, I don't avoid the convertibles just simply because you know, you looking at the tops on some of them, they look pretty bad. Um, not really a big fan of convertibles anyway. You're gonna have limited interior space as well. So 2017. V8, I recommend if you're going to get a V6, get a 2016 plus. I just stay away from the 14 and 15s because they changed a lot of the naming convention in 2016 and 2017. Um, and the old ones simply just aren't the same. They're kind of older vehicles at this point. I don't know what car I'm going to do yet tomorrow because I was thinking about it. If you guys have any suggestions on what car you want to see tomorrow, I was trying to keep the theme of like muscly cars, but I'm trying to think of what else I could do because I'm out of muscle cars to do. I did the GT500. I did the um, ZL1. I did the um, well. It's yeah, as you can see, it's been an hour and a half. And ZL1 GT500, and this car was yesterday. What did I, oh Hellcat? What other muscle cars are there that are from those types of model years? I'm talking like 2012 to 2019. What other muscly cars were on the market during that time? Because right now I can't think of any. Maybe like an Audi S5, but that's like a supercharged V6 at the max. Like this one, like I'm talking one that makes this type of this type of power. Like what kind of car makes this type of power that is a sports car like a coupe and has a V8? I have no idea. Maybe a Mercedes C63 coupe, but we already did that, so I don't want to do it again. Um, yeah, I'm talking about the NA, the NA one, the actual 6.2 liter. Um, the new ones obviously have the four liter. They, so it's not the same. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna think about that today. Do some brainstorming. You know, it's hard. It's funny because you ne you can never see this because my green screen. The RS five. I did the RS five. Wait, <laughs> I don't even remember the cars I did. I did so many. I think I did the RS five or I did the S five. Um, actually, let me take a look real quick. All this account thing right now. Switch accounts. Hopefully, you guys don't see any compromising information on my screen. <laughs> I don't know what would show up, but we're live. Um, let's see. Oh, you can see how much I made. As you can see, I don't make any money doing this. I do this for fun. I made thirty-four bucks. Um, 
since uh, this month. <laughs> Thirty four dollars. That's how much I used to make like in half an hour. <laughs> it took me a month. <laughs> uh, so what was I going to? Oh yeah, I'm gonna be perfectly transparent with you all today, I guess. So we're going to the live. Um, R eight Audi R eight. I don't even know when I did S five. I'm pretty sure I skipped it though. So I don't see it on this first page. I don't believe I did an S five this early, or I had to have done an S five or R S five. I did one of the two. Yeah, I'm gonna do Bentleys and Rolls Royces. I did a Bentley Continental a long time ago, like the OG Continental, the cheap one that everyone uh, thinks they can afford. Uh, but I'm gonna do some Rolls Royces. I'm gonna do the OG Phantom. Um, I'm gonna do a, a new Wraith because I really love the new Wraith. That is like one of the best combinations of everything you could get in terms of a car: luxury coupe, V12, big back seats, the looks, the presence, like everything. The Wraith is just like a perfect car in my opinion. Um, if you're into that kind of luxury stuff, like that's like the perfect luxury car. All right, I'm I'm tripping. I don't really see. <laughs> Okay, so I guess I didn't do an RS car at all. So yeah, I can do the Audi RS5 tomorrow. Why not? I thought that I did it though. Like, I could have sworn I did the Audi RS5. Oh, it's right here. Audi RS5. Yeah, I did it. Show number 10. So a while ago, I did the Audi RS5, but it is here. Um, but yeah, now I got to think of another one to do. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see tomorrow. You'll see the thumbnail up. I'll probably upload it tonight. But if you guys have no other questions, I think I'm going to head out. I got lots of stuff to do today. It's five o'clock. Wow, it's five o'clock. Holy crap. Usually I finish around like one or two, but you guys wanted me to start later. So I'm doing that. I hope you guys, um, you know, are able to watch it more now because it's in a more appropriate time. If this time is actually worse for you, let me know. I'm just trying to figure out when is best for me to stream um, and work my schedule around that. But if you guys don't really have anything else, I will see you guys tomorrow with another car review. As I mentioned, try to find someone who works harder than me at this. I don't think you can do it. Um, yeah, I'll see you guys then. And always, and as always, have a good one.